Hello everybody, my name is Spencer Walsh and welcome to this episode of Hidden History. This past Monday, we celebrated a brand new federal holiday for the very first time. That was Juneteenth, the day that the last slaves found out that they were freed almost two years after the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation. This week on the show, we look at what came after, Reconstruction. It's not exactly a hidden part of history, it's talked about a lot, but I really don't think it's appropriately appreciated. It was a time of great hope where some of the first and most effective black electeds saw office for the very first time. Then, of course, it all ended in tragedy. We'll take a look at how that process unfolded from the very beginning to the very end with the help of a top historian in the field. That historian is Heather Cox Richardson, and today we will be borrowing pretty heavily from her piece, Killing Reconstruction, to really kind of get into some of the most devastating parts of that story that really was quite, you know, influential, really a hinge point in our history and so much about our domestic history, our race relations, our class structure, you know, just the so many institutions that grew out of it will really still continue to haunt us today in a way that, you know, also I don't think is too well discussed or discussed nearly enough. Um, Yeah, so the slaughter of hundreds of thousands on the battlefield did not simply end slavery in America. It also created a new kind of national government designed to promote economic opportunity for everyone. So this came, you know, we all kind of know the story. It was the end of the Civil War. You know, there's a really harsh desire um, from people in the North as they really kind of struggled to fight and fund a war that was unthinkable at the time. For Americans, it really was a total war. It was a war that obviously, you know, you heard the tropes pitted brother against brother, all that stuff. And there really was an effort to say, okay, now, 100 years after the founding of the country, we can really try and push to make our founding words true. Um, Between 1860 and 70, it seemed a second American revolution finally aligned the Constitution with the promise of the Declaration of Independence that all men were created equal. And it did not last. A year after ratification of the 15th Amendment, people were already beginning to sour on the idea of a truly popular government. And it really seemed to come from some of the chaos that we were seeing early on in the South at that time, uh, where, you know, there was a crazy idea of black men running, uh, you know, states like South Carolina, where they were ruining it and making it, um, you know, the, quote, the interference of ignorant labor with politics is dangerous to society. Um, so that was some of the quotes at the time. Um, and this was even in the North, um, you know, where workers were kind of continuing to rise emboldened by some of the uh, rights that were given and the, the revolutionary spirit that was in the air at the time. They concluded that not everyone really should have a say in government. Um in 1875, the Supreme Court suggested and concluded that citizens could be denied voting rights so long as the discrimination was not based around race. The next year, Reconstruction was over, and white voters took back the South. The usual story, uh, you know, really heaps some of the failure on some Southern whites, helped by Andrew Johnson and the counter-revolution that he led that this piece here by Heather Cox Richardson will get into, but the Confederates did not control national politics, and really, you got to look at the people who did, and those were the Northerners. Um, while we obviously will talk about the South and the way the South interspersed with the North, Heather Cox Richardson throughout this piece really does a very interesting job of highlighting and making clear to all that this was a project that failed because the North, which were by far the dominant power at the time, the South had been just decimated. A good chunk of the war had taken place in the South, and obviously the South had been the losing side. So what happened then? You know, it was the up to, really up to the North to carry out Reconstruction, do it properly, and, you know, really see the project through to its end. And it just didn't. 
From March through May 1871, workers in Paris established a commune. The relatively minor development in world affairs became headline news in America because in 1866, after years of failure, entrepreneurs had finally completed a transatlantic telegraph cable that linked America to Europe. The Franco-Prussian War of 1870-71 had provided sensational copy to feed a nation hungry for exciting news after its own war. With the end of the conflict, editors turned to scenes from the commune to fill their columns. They reported lurid stories of the commune as a nightmare, a wild, reckless, irresponsible, and murderous mobocracy. Workers in Paris had taken over the government and were confiscating all money, factories, and lands. Their plan was to redistribute wealth from men of means to themselves. The Philadelphia Inquirer claimed that the communists of Paris were operating with a communistic idea that property is robbery. In response, in really... In that, they were echoing the International Working Men's Association, which the Boston Evening Transcript warned was made up of agrarians, levelers, revolutionaries, insiders, or anarchy, and promoters of indiscriminate pillage and murder. So, you know, to put it one way, the elites of the time, especially the northern elites that really did control the newspapers at this time, were pretty hell-bent on making sure that the people back home, the people in America who had just been decimated both in the North and the South by the Civil War, didn't get any funny ideas. Few Northerners during the Civil War would have believed the working class would deliberately destroy society uh, around that time. It seemed a little bit of a crazy thing to, to believe. Indeed, a lot of Republicans, again, those were the people in the North, the anti, a party that was really founded on anti-slavery for a variety of reasons, not, you know, not always the most selfless reasons. You know, there's a lot of worry about, you know, the free labor uh, orthodoxy and just this um, want for the labor of the North to not be undercut by free slaves and free labor from the South. Um, but they thought workers, Republicans did, thought that workers were key to a healthy economy, and they remade their government during the war to respond to the needs of those they believed were central to the Union cause. Pushing aside the plain Indians, Republicans passed the Homestead Act to put every man on his own farm, creating public colleges in the Department of Agriculture to make sure farmers had access to the newest innovations. They funded a transcontinental railroad to take, to take settlers to western fields and mines. Finally, they passed the 13th Amendment to the Constitution, abolishing slavery. You know, it really was kind of a remarkable attitude at the time. We saw Republican Owen Lovejoy say, quote, what is beneficial to the people cannot be detrimental to the government, for in this country, the interests of both are identical, uh, which, you know, imagine our po any politician saying this and actually acting on it nowadays. Um, and for a lot of American history, it would have been a pretty unthinkable thing to kind of espouse out loud in political arena. But that is where the Republicans were. It truly was a remarkable time of crisis. And obviously, as you know, uh, when crisis happens, it creates a lot of opportunity. So Lovejoy goes on to say, with us, the government is simply an agency through which the people act for their own benefit. Schools, Department of Agriculture would increase the prosperity of agriculture, manufacturers, and commerce. The upfront costs would be richly paid over and over again in the absolute increase of wealth. There is no doubt of that, insisted notorious budget hawk William Pitt Fessenden, um, which is pretty remarkable because you know, even a budget hawk is saying if we invest now in things like schools, public schools, and you know agricultural support, it will be paid over uh, in the overall growth in the economy. When Northern Democrats howled in horror at the racial equity established by the 13th Amendment, Republican James Ashley of Ohio retorted their free labor would make America the most powerful and populous, the most enterprising and wealthy nation in the world. Only six years later, Republicans were willing to entertain the idea that far from being the heart of America, workers were dangerous levelers. This is, again, just after the Civil War, and, and as the 60s turned the 70s, and there were communists um, on the march, which the government needed to fight off through its own powers. One thing to kind of understand about the Civil War time is that the economy was booming, especially in the North, when there had been a whole load of, you know, tons of manufacturing needed for the wartime effort. 
as we know, nothing kind of booms the economy like the wartime. Look at the United States after World War II, especially in the wake of World War II, when all of these goods were being invented, were being manufactured at really a breakneck pace. Um, and this boom was largely created, at least, by Republicans. Republicans were in power at the time. That is a pretty key thing to understand. Another key thing to understand is that the parties were just completely nonsensical if we were to look at them through the modern lens. They didn't, ha- they didn't have kind of coherent political interests. They were just instead made up of coalitions through kind of you know, party loyalty and a very kind of eclectic mix of interests that didn't really seem to have that much in common. For example... Uh, we saw the Republicans, um, you know, kind of be made up of around the time some of the more elites uh, in the North and uh, some of the more peasant uh, farmers and the people who wanted to really go West, the Midwestern laborers, uh, the people who are much more tied to the fields, much more agrarian. Uh, but again, as the 60s turned to the 70s, the elites really started to control that party, whereas the Democrats were made up of immigrant laborers who were really not getting uh, – becoming very unhappy with some of the conditions. There was a, a increasing complaints out of New York City, uh, which was at that time – it seems pretty crazy – probably one of the most – uh, important parts of what was the biggest swing state in the country. And yes, New York was a swing state at that time in national elections, and the state was brought, uh, kind of largely Republican, but the city kind of did t- tend to swing uh, one way or another because of the large portion of immigrants uh, coming in, the Irish, Italian immigrants that were heavily Democratic. I, mean, I think Boss Tweed around that time, T- you know, Tammany Hall, the machines, the Democratic machines, of kind of, a, you know, immigrant labor and very just, yeah, again, machine style politics, looking after your own and very local based. Um, that nationally with the Democrats was part of a coalition of what was essentially the Southern plantation owners, plantation owners. But that mattered way less because they were kind of politically disenfranchised. The, the Democrats of the North were actually quite enfranchised and they were becoming pretty unhappy with the Republicans. Hence, the real effort that we see by Republicans warning that what was happening in Paris with these communes and these crazy people who wanted to steal private property, that all could, you know, that that was something that really threatened the Republicans' power structure. Um, In the New York Times, uh, in April 1871, at that time, it was a Republican newspaper, uh, the very extravagances and horrible crimes of the Parisian communists will for some years weaken the influence of working class uh, uh, weaken the influence of the working class in all countries. The great middle class, which now governs the world, will everywhere be terrified at these terrible outbursts and absurdities. They will hold a strong reign on the lower. And then, yeah, it kind of goes to show you, even then, everyone thought they were middle class, even back in 1860 or 71. Anyway, that leads us to turn the page to a Republican who, who actually, I apologize, acted a little bit at the time like a Republican, but was in re- or was appointed or was uh, brought on by a Republican, Abraham Lincoln, but was actually in reality a Democrat. And, you know, through, through the efforts of unity, you know, Andrew Johnson was picked to kind of bring the country together by a- Abraham Lincoln as the Civil War came to a close. Uh, he was a kind of a doe-faced Democrat um, who would very much be amenable to the South, but was very unamenable, you know, kind of on a personal basis to Southern slave owners. Uh, He was brought on as a kind of look, you know, I can play both sides. I can bring the country together. I'm a unifier. That's what Abraham Lincoln took at his pitch towards the electorate in the 1864 election, won and appointed one Andrew Johnson as his vice president. Andrew Johnson, a Tennessee Democrat, who, by the way, was Stone cold drunk, drunk as a skunk, as they say at his inauguration, had to kind of be helped off by the, uh, some senators and just kind of viewed as uh, a as disgrace uh, to the office. A few months later, he'd be the president. Excuse me, that would be Lincoln's second inaugural. He was a uh, drunk at. He was the vice president. He was being inaugurated as the vice president at the time. After this, we'll find out what exactly Johnson did to reform the country in the wake of a tragic death and the need to rebuild.
Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Hidden History. Before we continue, a quick and very important announcement. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening and supporting Newsflash. We now have a brand new way for you to be heard if you want, whether a text message or a audio message. Please, no video messages. I really just do not think that's necessary. We have a new feedback box open for you Ladies and gentlemen, it is officially open. SWRN702 at gmail.com. Send a text message. Send a voice message um, of no more than 30 seconds via the voice memos function. Either of those two options, and we will 100%, 100%, not going to find this guarantee anywhere else. We're going to play it on the show. Listen to what you have to say. And it literally could be about anything. Well, if it's inappropriate, we won't play it. But it could be about anything. Thank you so much. This is my thank you to all the listeners who have stuck out with us and want to have their own voice in the show. SWRN702 at gmail.com is the address. All right. So I want to bring your attention to directly after the war and the South essentially is pissed. They are passing. They got all their governments back up as soon as they can. They try and pass what became Black Codes, which is a series of laws that would essentially just make black people in the South de facto slaves. Um, you know, it was the really awful things like, for example, in Mississippi, uh, you see black children get apprenticed to their you know, obviously white masters, black men could be arrested, fined, and then hired out to anyone who paid their fines. Most states sentenced vagrants to forced labor and punishment for breaking laws with a lash, chain gang, or a fine that required a person to work for a man who paid it. And again, key here is nowhere could a black person testify against a white person. Republicans were not cool with this at all. They wanted to, you know, reward unionists, even in the South, who had been loyal to them and really helped them win, especially if they were African-American at the time. Um, And they sensibly refused to seat any of the newly elected Southern congressmen who were obviously uh, white Republicans or sorry, white Democrats. Um, So this comes as the period just directly kind of again after the period of the war where their congress is still kind of trying to get its act together they're still trying to chart out a path for congressional reconstruction um this included some of the ideas that were kind of coming out of this at the time in 1866 expanding the freedmen's bureau to try and get uh some of the black actually poor uh, black and white Southerners who had really also been decimated by the war. Uh, you know, black people obviously were decimated for hundreds and hundreds of years, but, you know, white people pretty decimated by the war and, you know, using a lot of kind of victims of a lot of, kind of racial solidarity to not realize the fact that they're way closer to the slave owners than the slave mass or sorry, uh, the uh, slaves and the slave masters. Um, so they were both kind of helped by the Freedmen's Bureau to try and get the education and the land that they lacked. Um, They were not very happy at all with this. Some of the Democratic elites of the area, the former plantation owners and slave owners, Congress also provided for federal courts in which African-Americans could testify and sit on juries, Uh, but was all vetoed by Andrew Johnson. In his veto messages, the president tied racism to fears of a dangerous underclass and hatred of new federal taxes the Republicans had created during the war to raise funds for you know this pretty amazing economic boom of manufacturing that we have seen. Um, Johnson really amazingly kind of paved the way uh, for this racist dislike and disdain of quote unquote big government because the government has expanded massively throughout the course of the Civil War to you know expand to literally fight the war. Um, Johnson enlisted traditional Southern racism to attack the argument that governor the government could help the poor men rise, ignoring the benefits for white Southerners. He claimed the measures would simply give a handout to lazy blacks paid for by hardworking white men. And a lot of those, again, hardworking white men would also be benefited by the same programs, um, as well as the blacks who had really, frankly, needed it a fair bit more. Um, 
he said that the authority to give people houses and education was beyond the scope of the government and that Congress had essentially no right to do what he uh, or what it was trying to do. Um, since the government had acquired the treaty by land and distributed the Homestead Act on, and the Land Grant College Act, um, you know, and had distributed this out, um, Johnson essentially was able to kind of create the fear that the government, you know, which, you know, the wealthier Democrats kind of knew this was aimed at them and kind of poorer citizens of the South were kind of swept up in this rhetoric as well. Why should the government help out freedmen, freed blacks, when they had never helped out any freed whites? They're just giving yeah, any government handouts, not really doing anything remarkable. I guess the quote was, um, why, uh, kind of in a rhetorical question he asked, should the government provide homes for ex-slaves when it had never done so for white men? Uh, and creating this fear of a dangerous, kind of educated, landed, black class, which was really designed to scare the pants off of not only the Democratic Southern elites, but a lot of the Democratic poor or the Southern poor, white poor, even though it would, a lot of the Freedmen's Bureau programs were aimed at them as well. Up next, how the Democrats over time sifted away from outright racism and used class warfare to achieve their same racist aims down south. As Reconstruction through Jackson, or sorry, through Johnson came under attack throughout the latter half of the 1860s, it was also under attack in the South. As Republicans began to kind of fearmonger about Northern workers in 1871, Southern Democrats really kind of got smart. Essentially, as blacks were allowed to vote, the 15th Amendment establishing black male suffrage in 1870. Um, South Carolina was kind of the perfect case study for a lot of fears that w black slaves essentially would come in and use their power of literally just voting to steal all the money, steal all the property from the wealthy whites in kind of a real, not only racial, but class fear as well. The Southerners playing off of these kind of scary reports from Republicans up north of these poor people getting power, being able to vote. And they had always said that poor people being able to vote, whether they're black or white, would destroy society because they had to kind of be kept down. They had to be controlled. They formed society. They prov provided the foundation for society and all that society did. But in the words of these folks, in kind of an idea that really goes back to the creation of the Constitution, see Alexander Hamilton's remarks about the people calling them a great beast, that they need to be kept down, controlled, and very, very carefully monitored because then they could really disrupt the natural order of things because of, in the elite's view, their lack of intellect. To the eyes of these men, especially in the South, they carried on what really was the view of the Founding Fathers that because they had all this property, because they had all this wealth and virtue, they must be pretty good. And because they were pretty good, they must be able to run the country. And they must be the only people that can run the country, most importantly. The North and the virtuous elites of the North had sacrificed their control and thus their control and you know, existence of their society by letting those poor people vote, letting the foundation be upset, and letting the harmony, in their view, be destroyed. They're committing, in the eyes of the South, a grave mistake. This was essentially the logic that later found purchase in the Civil War Revisionist School of History called the Dunning School, and essentially went like this. When Republicans guaranteed the suffrage to black men, they enabled Democrats to recall the planters' argument that letting the riffraff vote would force this redistribution of wealth. Republican voters would, or sorry, politicians would be courting black voters by promising, you know, blacks to actually have a job and a place and a position in society. Then they would try and get out of the low playing field work, but they would not be there to do the production and make the, you know, raw goods and materials and economic activity that the South desperately needed. They would instead just quote unquote clog up the government uh, a democratic newspaper in New York claiming that there would soon be Negro governors Negro mayors of cities and Negro occupants of every grade of office state and municipal this would be funded by good again hardworking white taxpayer dollars these same hardworking whites that would also kind of be kept under the economic foot of democratic elites and republican elites 
in both the South and the North. And since the poor African Americans would not have to pay the taxes they levied, their governments would be among the most wasteful and corrupt ever existed. Black governments would perpetuate robbery, making extravagant expenditures for road schools, hospitals, asylums, and other public institutions. Again, when they say extravagant expenditures, they literally just mean building those things. You know, literally just building basic services and basic services that they could access. Because if you're white and rich, you didn't need those services. You could just get them all privately catered to you. It was literally like a feudal state. Um, But for the rest of those people, none of them had access to any of these services in large parts of the country, especially the South and the Midwest. And those were some of the things that the Reconstruction governments of the time built for the very first time in the South. Um, South Carolina legislators had a black majority in 1871. In reality, African-American legislators tended to vote in favor of property interests rather than workers, but white observers insisted there were these radical levelers. To rebuild the shattered state, the legislature levied new taxes. But while taxes in South Carolina had fallen disproportionately on professionals, bankers, and merchants before the war, the new legislature placed taxes on large landowners because, again, before, large landowners were originally in control. The same legislature that also used state funds to buy land to sell to settlers, usually freed men at low prices. This is the same kind of you know, fear of corruption, quote-unquote, that was actually just a transfer of power uh, from in, in wealth and resources from the uh, rich Democrats to the poor freedmen. Um, they, you know, railed in agony, in racist agony, against this, quote-unquote, Crow Congress. Uh, they also interpreted the tax for a new class lens, kind of worrying about it through that lens, interestingly, as well. One observer commenting that with the prominent white South Carolinians disenfranchised and black men voting, a proletariat parliament had been constituted, the likes of which could not have been produced under the widest suffrage in any part of the world, save in some of these southern states. When the Southern Carolina government began to collect a new tax called a taxpayers' convention, uh, a... Uh, kind of formed, insisting that workers were confiscating property. Um, Eventually, though, due to some of the fear that the Northern Republicans had of their own burgeoning working class, they began to obtain, again, Northern Republicans were the elites at the time, a good chunk of them, um, or I should say the elites were Republicans. There were other non-elite Northern Republicans at the time. They began to uh, entertain some of these ideas. So all over the North and the South, this fear of the mob began to rise. A New York Tribune um, ran an interview with the Georgia Democrat, Robert Toombs, a former slaveholder who had been a staunch secessionist and served as the first Confederate Secretary of State. He explained that a mob was the most dangerous class in the world to be trusted with any powers of government unless voting was limited to men of property, the lower classes. The dangerous, irresponsible element would control government and, quote, attack the interests of landed proprietors. According to Toombs, only those who own the country should government govern it, and the men who hold no property had no right to make laws for property holders. There again, we see the property tied to the virtue, um, and then again, when it comes down to it, tied to the control. In the end... The Taxpayers Convention called only for Southern Carolina to uh, so the South Carolina government to trim its budget, but the convention's work could reach far beyond that lackluster end. White Southerners had managed to turn their racial animosities into an economic argument acceptable to Northern Republicans. Republicans continued to link class and racial animosities. What was happening in South Carolina, they warned, was just like what was going on in New York. Both were being ruled by irresponsible non-property holders and taxpayers, they said, must stand against the growth of government, even for good ends, because it inevitably bred waste and corruption. Uh, So again, this really kind of mobilization and fear uh, spreading throughout the elites of both the North and the South. The timing of the South Carolina Taxpayers Convention spread its language widely across the North. In the next year's presidential election, pro-grant and anti-grant factions fought for control of the Republican Party. Anti-grant forces used the language of the convention to attack Reconstruction governments that Grant supported in southern states. In Republican as well as Democratic newspapers, story after story repeated the idea that southern governments were corrupt and that lazy black legislators were too, were using government contracts to funnel the wealth of white taxpayers to poor ex-slaves. Again, the worries that, that that would happen, you know, by working classes both you know black and good chunks white in the Republican North as well. When the economy crashed in 1873, northern reformers were primed to attack socialism across the country. 
E.L. Godkin, who is the editor of The Nation, you may have heard of it, explained that African Americans were slightly above the level of animals and were plundering property holders. The sum and substance of it all is confiscation, he said. The North, he went on, uh, had taxpayers begging for relief from those imitating South Carolina and making socialism in America the dangerous, deadly poison that it is. It was not taxation people opposed, an author wrote in the Scrivener's Monthly, but rather an unjust, tyrannical, arbitrary, overwhelming taxation producing revenues which never get any further than the already bursting pockets of knaves and dupes, which I think you can read pretty safely there, black people and really poor people in general, but, you know, by and large, uh, newly freed slaves. In 1875, the Supreme Court offered... um, a way to guard America from this creeping socialism. In Minor versus Happersett, it ruled the citizenship did not necessarily guarantee voting rights. This opened the door for restrictions based on qualifications other than race, which was prohibited under the 15th Amendment. In the election of 1816, or sorry, 1876, whites took back the South. In 1880, the former Confederacy would vote solidly Democratic. By 1890, the trend in America was to keep the vote away from workers, immigrants, and people of color, even as white middle-class women won it at the state level. A push in 1889 to protect black voting and establish federal funding for schools created a backlash as people conjured up images of Reconstruction as an era as where a large mass of ignorant voters had taken over the government and ruined the South. Again, all they tried to do is raise taxes on people who had literally paid no taxes and ruled the area, ruled the territory like a feudal landscape for decades and decades and decades to build basic functions of government like schools, like agricultural departments, like courts that would actually represent them fairly. For this, again, they were charred and feathered, oftentimes violently. You can check out our um episode a few seasons back about the only successful coup in America to talk about uh, one specific instance of when a reconstruction government was attacked by white racists. But, you know, this has happened multiple times. You know, Black Wall Street, another kind of example of something happening around this time, this real outcry and backlash uh, towards any sort of black political power, any sort of foothold that they could get in the country was really, really quite strong. White voters as a class are the more intelligent, masterful, and powerful, and they are the property owners. And one, you know, is really, really closely tied to the other in the minds of the people at the time. This is from a quote from Harper's Weekly. Uh, black men simply wanted to confiscate white tax dollars. Southern whites appealed to the businessmen of the North to keep lazy black men from voting and imperiling not only the properties of Southern, but of Northern men also. Railroad stocks, state bonds, city bonds, county bonds, mining and manufacturing interests. In 1890, the New York Times suggested limiting suffraging, suffrage based on either education or property to keep poor voters from more, uh, poor workers from voting. Mississippi did just that, and other states soon followed suit. Northern states also found ways to restrict voting by immigrants and poor whites. There was only one final necessary step to keep poor voters from corrupting government, to reject any government workers and African Americans supported, even if they had won fair and square. And this is what we talked about in Wilmington, North Carolina, uh, where some of the quote-unquote best citizens, which were the rich citizens, the white citizens, they got, uh, you know, put on their little masks and ran the government out of towns. Uh, black and white coalition government, a populist that really wanted to, you know, govern equitably, fairly, and redistribute wealth. Wealth also, you know, build a government, a modern government that we recognize today, uh, through again raising some taxes and putting some taxes basically on the people that had owned the country um, for since its founding, frankly. Uh, property was not safe, and officials and police officers who had been hired under the coalition in the past were so quote-unquote incompetent that highly esteemed men and women were assaulted on the streets crazy well it was really the people who were writing that narrative uh, that were doing the assaulting in november 1898 a citizens council organized and burned a black owned newspaper office murdered between 50 and 60 african americans and forced the fairly elected coalition members to resign their offices one white man declared we will never again be ruled of men by men of african origin the political events of Reconstruction established in the American mind, both among anti-slavery Northerners and reactionary Southerners, the idea that an active government redistributed, redistributing wealth um, from hardworking white people to lazy African Americans is one to be fought against, really, eternally. 
The idea that has put a gentle, genteel veneer on arguments against both black rights and protection for workers. In the 50s and 60s, it enabled movement conservatives to oppose integration by arguing that government efforts to promote equality were sucking tax dollars from hardworking white men to provide benefits from African Americans. You know, this welfare queen strategy that we've very famously seen. Um, Ronald Reagan talking about this, the ultimate government moocher with 80 names, 30 addresses, 12 social security cards, who's collecting veteran benefits on four non-existing deceased husbands, and all that stuff. Again, the really non-existing part is the idea of the welfare queen, uh, you know, is that the fact that the existence of the welfare queen is really the the joke part, uh, the non-existent part. in 1968, we saw with Nixon, the Southern strategy, Republicans urge Americans to stand against communism and integration, a strategy uh, political operative um, Lee Atwater famously described as a way to say the N-word while only talking about economic freedom. And it was really kind of a genius political strategy that's kind of been watered down over the years, started as the outright racism of the uh, Reconstruction period, this fear that, you know, good, rich White men, virtuous white men, would be taken out of their position of government, their position of power, um, by blacks who got fairly elected uh, just to kind of funnel money to them and their friends. Uh, these knaves and dupes, as they were referred to. Again, it kind of uh, went through the 50s and 60s and with the integration fights and really is quite noticeable today in this fear-mongering about welfare um, and the welfare queen trope. The idea also echoes the rhetoric deployed by the right against Barack Obama. A black president, by the peculiar definition laid down 150 years ago, must be a socialist in his mind. Obama was far from it. And by the way, a lot of the people that elected, uh, that were elected, who even were black, were far from socialists as well. And it threatens to echo into the future. As libertarians insist, it is not racial or class biases that make them want to undermine the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and protections for workers. They simply want to promote individual freedom. This is one of the most strong ideological currents on the right wing of the American political spectrum today, and it all comes from reconstruction. Hope you enjoyed that little look into our history. Thanks so much to this uh, Heather Cox Richardson article, wonderful article called Killing Reconstruction in the Jacobin Magazine. I'm sure published other places as well. Uh, you know, really, really interesting. You know, just bottom line is this trope that, you know, the, the welfare queen, the government moocher, the idea that uh, redistributive resources and this, uh, this redistribution uh, of along class lines uh, connecting it to racial fear and animus has some pretty deep roots and has been a pretty common trope in our country that still stands up today. Thank you so much for listening. It's been an absolute pleasure. We will see you next Friday. It's in history.